Algebra 1 EOC Review Part 1 Linear Functions In this brief review, I'm going to go over what is a function, domain and range, relations and functions, vertical line test, what is a linear function, how to evaluate a function, and examples of problems that you're going to see on the Algebra 1 EOC exam. So first of all, what is a function? A function is a rule where every number that you input into that rule can only have one answer or one output. Down here I have an example of a function. It's written in function notation. The way you would read this is f of x equals 2x plus 1. So when I input a number into this function, you substitute it for this variable. So if I want to input a number, I'm going to substitute it for the variable x, work out what's here, and it can only give me one answer. Una función es una regla donde cada número que yo entro dentro de esa regla solamente me puede dar una respuesta. Aquí abajo tengo un, un ejemplo de una función. Está escrito en notación de función. Esto se lee f de x es igual a 2x más 1. Cuando entro un, un número dentro de esa función, estoy sustituyendo ese número para el variable x. Cuando resuelvo esta expresión, solamente me puede dar una respuesta. Ok, so domain and range. Domain is the set of all the x values and range is the set of all the y values. It's written on the top here, okay? So domain is the set of all the x values. Range is the set of all the y values. El dominio es el grupo de todos, todos los valores de x. Y el rango es el grupo de todos los valores de y. Relations and functions. Every example that you see on the screen is a relation. A relation is just a group of x coordinates that are matched up with the with their associated y coordinates All right so that's what these arrows are pointing to again a relation is a group of x coordinates that are connected to an associated y coordinate so everyone every example on here is a relation the question is which one of these relations are functions okay um, the answers are highlighted in blue because I'm not gonna go over every example but remember the definition of a function. In a function, every input can only have exactly one output. Another way to put it is, in a function, every value of x can only have one value of y. So let's look at two examples. Let's look at this example first. Okay, is this relation a function? As you can see, the answer is yes. Now let's look at y. Okay, in this relation, when x is 4, y is 7. When x is negative 1, y is 2. When x is negative 13, y is 1. When x is positive 10, y is 2. Every single x value has only one y value associated to it. Every single input, which by the way, the x values are the input and the y values are the output. Every single input has exactly one output. Now let me show you something that... Um, you may have noticed, all right? So when x is negative 1, and also when x is uh, 10, both of them give you the same output. That is OK, because again, remember what the definition is. In order to be a function, every input can only have one output, or every x can only have one y. OK, when x is negative 1, I only get one answer. I get positive 2. And when x is positive 10, I only get one answer y equals 2. So that's fine. That checks off the definition of a function. Now let's look at this example over here that is not a function to point out the, the difference between that and this relation. In this relation over here, look at 18. When x is 18, I get two different answers. I get 11 and I also get 15. That is not a function because in order to be a function, every input can only have one output. Every x value can only have one y value. And in this case, when I input the x value of 18, I output two different values for y. And that is uh, a no-no. You cannot do that 
in order to be a function. So that is why this is not a function. Again, this one is because every x value only has one y value. All right, so learn to think about it that way. Every input only has one output, or every x value can only have one y value, so that you don't get confused. You should look at these other examples before the exam to make sure you're sure of that because you're definitely going to have a few questions on that, and they're easy. Okay, así que eh, una relación es un grupo de valores de x que están conectados a los valores de y. Ok, así que cada ejemplo que tengo aquí son, es un ejemplo de una relación. Cada uno de ellos es una relación donde cada valor de X tiene un valor de Y conectado a ese valor de, de X. Ahora, la pregunta es, ¿cuál de estas relaciones son funciones? Para hacer una función, recuerden de la definición, para hacer una función, cada valor de X solamente puede tener un valor de Y. O en otras palabras, cada número que tú entras solamente, solamente puede eh, sacar otro número. No te puede dar más que, un, más que una respuesta. Así que, por ejemplo, uh, vamos a mirar dos ejemplos. ¿okay? En este ejemplo, cada valor de X solamente tiene un valor de Y. O cada número que uno entra solamente es, eh, tiene un número que sale. Lo, el dominio o los valores de X son los números que se entran y el rango o los valores de Y son los números que salen. Ok, ahora lo que quería enseñar era que aquí en esta relación, cuando X es negativo 1, Y es 2 y también cuando X es 10, Y es 2. Eso está bien porque lo que tienen que, otra vez, si se confunden, piensen de la definición. Aquí cada valor de X tiene un valor de Y. Sí, cuando X es negativo 1, solamente cojo una, un un valor de Y que sería 2 y cuando X es 10 solamente cojo una respuesta para Y que sería 2 así que eso está bien ok pero aquí tengo el otro ejemplo donde cuando tengo este valor de X 18 me da dos diferentes respuestas para Y o en otras palabras cuando entro 18 salen dos diferentes números y eso no puede ser para que sea una función ok Um, así que por, por, esa, por esa razón, esta relación no es una función. Deben mirar todos los ejemplos cuando tengan tiempo antes del examen, porque seguro que van a haber varias preguntas sobre esto y son bien fácil. All right, moving on. The vertical line test. It's related to what I just said. All right, the vertical line test is when you get a graph, a way to quickly and easily determine whether that graph is a function or not. Okay, so let me let me show you with this first example. And by the way, once again, the answers are here. And on these examples, the answers are the darker blue ones. The dark blue ones are the answers in, in these on the right, okay? So let's look at this first example. The vertical line test means this. If I could draw a vertical line that intersects the graph in more than one spot, then it is not a function. Why? Because look. In this example, look at the coordinates for this point. The coordinates for this point are negative 4, positive 5, and the coordinates for this point right here are negative 4, positive 3. I have the same x value and I'm getting two different y values. And I just said that in order to be a function, every x value can only give you one y value. That is why this is not a function because when I do the vertical line test again if it passes the graph in more than one spot that's showing you that you're gonna have the same x value with two different two or more different uh, y values so therefore it is not a function same thing right here if I draw this line it intersects the graph in more than one spot those points are gonna have the same x coordinate but two different y coordinates so it's not a function okay now here I got a bunch of different pictures let's look at it real quick um, right here, this one, I could draw a vertical line and it intersects it in more than one spot. Therefore, it is not a, a function. Same thing with this one. It intersects in three spots. It is not a function. This one, however, is good. This one is also good. Notice that in order to be a function, it does not have to be a straight line. It could be a curvy line and it's still a function, all right? That's an exponential function. I'm going to make another video on that that you need to check out. 
all right? So look at these over here, a circle, nope, not a function. This one right here, nope, not a function. This one right here, nope, not a function. This one right here, yes. Again, notice that it does not have to be a straight line to be a function. It could be going up and then change directions and go down. That's still a function. And in this last one, all of them are functions, okay? All of these are functions. You should look at them while I explain this in Spanish, okay? Así que el examen de una línea vertical es básicamente cuando te dan un gráfico y te preguntan si esta relación es una función, okay? Si pueden dibujar una línea vertical que intersecta el gráfico en más que un lugar, entonces no ese gráfico o esa relación no puede ser una función. ¿Por qué? Porque aquí, le, aquí enseñé que cuando una línea vertical intersecta el gráfico en más de un lugar, entonces van a tener um, el mismo valor de el mismo coordinado para x con diferentes coordinados para y. Y recuerden la de definición de una función. Una función es que cada valor de x solamente tiene un valor de y. Así que por eso es que te enseña que no es una función, ¿ok? Aquí esta tampoco es una función. Aquí lo, las que están circuladas son funciones y las otras no son funciones. All right, moving on. So what is a linear function? Easy. It has the word line in it. So let the, let the, the, let the name tell you what it means. A linear function is a function that when you graph it, you get a straight line. And also, as, I, as it's written here, linear functions can be written in this form. You should notice that that form is basically slope-intercept form. The only difference is that instead of writing the y, they're writing it in function notation, but it means the same thing. And remember, in slope-intercept form, m is the slope, and b is the y-intercept. If it has anything weird, like an exponent or a radical sign, then it is not a, fu a, a linear function, okay? I'll say it again. If the function has anything weird like exponents or a radical sign, then it is not a linear function, okay? A linear function can be written in this form. And remember, just because it has a, a number back here doesn't mean that it has to have one written because what if the number is zero? If it's zero, then nothing's going to be written back here. So be aware of that. We'll look at some examples of linear functions in a second, okay? Um, así que una, fun una función lineal es una función que cuando hacen el gráfico te da una línea recta y que se puede escribir en esta forma, que ya deben saber que esta forma es la forma slope-intercept. La única diferencia es que aquí escribí Y y aquí está escrita en notación de función. Um, recuerden que en la forma slope-intercept M es el slope, la medida de la inclinación de la línea, y el y-intercept es la letra B, donde la línea intersecta el axis de Y. Si hay algo extraño en, en la ecuación, por ejemplo, un exponente o un signo radical, entonces no es una función lineal. Ok, now. Here I have a lot of different examples. The answers, because I'm not going to go over every single one, the answers are highlighted in blue. Well, I mean, I guess all of the, never mind, all of these are linear functions, okay? I just realized, forgot. Um, so all of these is, examples are examples of linear functions. Then I want to go over a couple things, all right? First of all, let's look at the examples on the top, all right? So if you look at the examples on the top, first of all, always notice the x values. In the x values on all of these on the top, they're increasing by one. They're going up by one, all of them. All right? So if the x values are, are just going up by one, then I could just look at the y values to analyze this. All right, now look what I wrote up here in red. In linear fun functions, you are adding the same number over and over again. All right, so in all of these linear functions, the y, they're being, you're just adding the same number over and over again. Now, if you look at this one and you see that it's going down, yeah, it's going down. You're subtracting 4 over and over again. So if you're subtracting 4, that means you're adding negative 4 over and over again, all right? Um, in this one, you're adding 7 over and over again, all right? If you, if you can't see what you're adding over and over again, you need to subtract the numbers 
and that'll tell you what are you adding over and over again, all right? Because for some of these, it's obvious, and for some of these, like if they throw in decimals, you may need to check that. So you would have to subtract. Like in this one, I would have to uh, subtract negative 7.45 minus 1.55 to figure out what are they adding over and over again, okay? Now, look at the bottom. Look down here, okay? I want you to, to notice something. On the examples I put in the bottom, look at the x values, first of all. They're not going up by 1, so that makes it more difficult to check if this is a linear function or not. So be careful with that. If the x values are going up by 1, then it's easy to check. But if they're not going up by 1, you got to check. And how do you check if it's a linear function? By using this formula for the slope, all right? So it's been a while since we do that. But remember that to do that, you just select a pair. Like let's say I want to I want to select this pair right here. I would label them x1, y1, x2, y2, and I would substitute them into the formula. So if I substitute this middle pair and this bottom pair into the formula, I'm gonna get 20 minus 8 over 10 minus 2, which in this case would give me 12 over 8. And when I simplify that by dividing the top and the bottom by four, I'm going to get three over two. All right. So what you're adding over, that tells me what I'm adding over and over again. That tells me two things. That's the slope of the line. And that's what's being added over and over again to the Y values. I'm just going saying that in case it comes up. All right. But, and also trying to point out that, hey, be careful. Always check to see if the X values are going up by, by one unit at a time. Because if they're not, be careful. You don't make a mistake. All right. Um, I see it. So when you have a linear function, you're always adding the same number over and over again. And when it's an exponential function, which I'm making a different video on that, but when it's an exponential function, you're multiplying the same number over and over again. But when it's linear, you're adding the same number over and over again. Okay, así que cuando tienen una función lineal, están sumando el mismo número cada vez a y. Pero siempre se tienen que fijar que cuando te dan, si te dan una tabla, que los valores de X están subiendo por 1. Si están subiendo por 1, es fácil an analizar los valores de Y. Okay? Aquí es fácil de ver que cada vez están restando 4. Eso quiere decir que están sumando negativo 4 cada vez. O también se puede pensar que están restando 4 cada vez. Okay? En este, están sumando 7 cada vez. Están sumando 7 cada vez. Ok. Si le dan uno como este, donde no pueden ver uh, claramente cuál número se están sumando, entonces tienen que restar este número menos el número anterior. Okay? Y abajo tengo ejemplos donde los valores de X no están subiendo por uno, así que es un poco más difícil ver por cuánto se está cambiando los valores de Y. Si, si le salen eso o necesitan saber, tienen que usar la fórmula para encontrar el slope. Ok, que ya hice una, un ejemplo. Y cuando usan esa fórmula, eso te dice, la respuesta te dice qué número están sumando cada vez. All right, so here I have an example of how to evaluate a function. This is super easy. All right, so this is how it's written, f of 9. That means you're plugging in the 9 into the function. So wherever the x is, you would substitute the number 9. So you would do this, follow the order of operations. 2 times 9 is 18, 18 minus 1 is 17, so f of 9 equals my answer, which is 17. All right, super easy. Okay, en una función, esto, de, esto quiere decir que, quieren que tiene que sustituir el valor que está aquí dentro de la función y sustituirlo donde quiera que esté este variable. Así que en este ejemplo estoy sustituyendo negativo 8 para x. Así que f de negativo 8 sería 9 más 12 por negativo 8. Siempre se tiene que eh, seguir la orden de operaciones, así que aquí tengo que multiplicar primero. Negativo 8 por 12 sería negativo 96. Ok, así que 9 menos 96 me daría negativo 87. Ok, así que F de negativo 8 es igual a negativo 87. Okay, so okay. Um, let's move on. Uh, should have put the answers for these here, but whatever. I don't have time for that right now. All right, let me continue. 
All right, so here it says, all right, so now we're going into the section where I'm going over examples of the types of problems that you may see on the Algebra 1 EOC, okay? And as you can see in the top right corner, I, I'm going to have a, a little emoji or whatever you want to call it, a little picture. Uh, this one means that it's on the section where where you don't use a calculator. And um, that that emoji would mean it's in the section where you do use a calculator, okay? Uh, the first day is without a calculator and the second day is with a calculator. All right, so this one, the first question is a piece of cake. The domain of this function is given by, this is the set of the domain, like all the values of x. So the question is, what is the range? I mean, that's a piece of cake. That means take each one of these values and plug it into the formula and plug it into the function, I should say, and work this out. All right, so like the first one, f of negative 2 would be, you would have to do 13 times negative 2 minus negative 2 to the second power and follow the order of operations all right so you would do that for each value that's in this set all right because that's the domain that's every single x value so every single answer you get would be the range and those are the answers you get for the range así que aquí la pregunta es eh, el dominio de esta función es lo siguiente que es el rango así que tienen que coger cada valor que está aquí para el dominio y entrarlo dentro de la función para coger la respuesta. Cada respuesta que cogen es el grupo del rango, que es la respuesta. Y aquí esto te dice que esto está en la sección donde no se usa una calculadora, que es el primer día del examen. Ok, um, next question. All right, look at this question because almost for sure you'll get something like this on the exam. And um, it's easy to overthink this. It's actually very simple, but it's easy to overthink. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, Jerome is constructing a table of va values that satisfies the definition of a function. Which number or numbers can be placed in the empty cell so that the table of values satisfies the definition of a function? Select all that apply. So there, there may be one, more than one correct answer, okay? Um, so listen, this just has to do with every input can only have one output. So when you look at the possible answers, like let's look at the first one. Um, now let's look at one, I wanna look at one of the wrong answers first, okay? Look at this answer right here, negative one. This answer is wrong and I'll tell you why. There's already a negative one here. Uh, by the way, so that the table of values satisfies the definition of a function. So look, already in this table, negative 1 is one of the inputs, and the output is 5. Whatever number you put here, the output is 13. If I were to put negative 1 here, that means that when x is negative 1, I get 5, and when x is negative 1, I get a different number, 13. And you can only have one, for every input, one output. So I cannot put negative 1 here, because if I put negative 1 here, this would not be a function. So negative 1 cannot be one of the answers. Negative 5, however is fine because there's no negative 5 up here in the input. So negative 5 would work. Negative 5 is correct. How about 0? Zero? 0 is already here. When you input 0, you get an output of negative 9. If I put 0 here, I also get an output of 13. So that does not work. That would make this not a function. 2, two would work because there's no 2 up here in the input. So that would work. 11 is already here. You get negative 1. If I put 11 here, that means I get a second answer, which is 13. 11 doesn't work. 17 is already here. It gives me 5. If I put 17 here, I get another different answer, which is 13. So that one doesn't work. So my only correct answers are negative 5 and positive 2. Okay, recuerden que esta pregunta es um, ¿Cuál número se pueden poner aquí en esta tabla para, para que esto sea una función? Recuerden que para una función, cada número que uno entra solamente te puede dar un número que salga. O cada valor de X solamente puede tener un valor de Y. Los números que, que están mal son porque ya están en esta tabla. Y si lo pongo aquí, en este espacio, te daría dos diferentes valores de Y. Porque ya aparecieron antes en esta tabla con un valor de Y diferente que la, la que está aquí. Así que solamente negativo 5 y 2 se pueden colocar en este espacio para que esto sea una función. All right, there are your answers. <clears throat> Number 16. 
Yara runs two miles the first day. She wants to run a quarter of a mile farther each day. What type of graph would show how much she runs each day? All right. Is she adding the same amount each day? Yes or no? All right. Her starting point is two miles per day. Her starting point is uh, she ran two miles the first day, and then she's going to run a quarter. That's a quarter, which equals that. She's going to run a quarter of a mile each day. Anyways, I just realized I didn't really need to write this, but this is how you would write the equation. But basically, if she's running the same amount each day, that means she's adding the same amount each day, a quarter of a mile. So it would be a linear, uh, a linear graph. It would be a straight line if she's adding the same amount each day. Okay? Um, dice que Yara corre dos millas la, el primer día y después de eso quiere correr um, un cuarto de una milla cada día. Recuerden que si están sumando la misma cantidad, oh, y la pregunta es qué tipo de gráfico se hace para enseñar cuánto ella corre cada día. Recuerden que si están sumando la misma cantidad cada, cada vez, eso es un ejemplo de una función lineal. ¿Ok? Así que eso sería la respuesta. <clears throat> okay. The function h of n gives the number of person hours it takes to assemble n engines in a factory. What is a reasonable domain? All right, look. This is a super easy type of question that's going to appear for sure on the exam. It, for sure, this is something like this is going to appear. Okay, so in this type of question, remember the domain. That Those are the values for x. Those are the numbers that you input into the function okay so look the function is h of n remember the number that you input goes right here inside the parentheses and what does that n stand for it says right here n stands for the number of engines so let me ask you a question can you have a negative amount of engines no can you can you can you put in like a half an engine or a fourth of an engine no you can only put in whole numbers so what is, it says, what is a reasonable domain? So don't come up with any kooky uh, ideas. What is a reasonable domain? What is a reasonable amount of number of engines that I could put in there? I could put one engine, two engines, three engines, etc. So positive numbers, and they got to be integers, right? So non-negative, that means they can't be negative. And they got to be integers. Integers means whole numbers, one, two, three, four. Okay, I'm not going to input 1.25 engines. So that's it. That's the answer. Let me just reread it to you. I know I, the question is worded maybe a little bit weird right here. The function h of n gives the number of person hours it takes to assemble n engines in a factory. All right, now I get it. Like the number of hours it takes to assemble n number of engines. All right, so just keep in mind, you can only have whole numbers and they got to be positive numbers. I'm telling you, you're almost for sure going to get a similar question on the exam, maybe more than once. And look, this takes no work except reading it correctly and, and reading the answers correctly. Okay, um, así que dice que la función h de n te dice lo, la, los números de personas, horas, necesario para asemblar n um, motores en una factoría. ¿Ok? ¿Qué es un dominio razonable para esta función? ¿Ok? Así que N representa el número de motores. ¿Ok? Y la pregunta es, ¿qué es un dominio razonable? Así que no piensen de algo extraño. ¿Ok? En los números de motores tienen que ser positivos y tienen que ser números enteros. No puede ser un, una mitad de, una, de un motor. Tiene que ser números enteros. Así que la respuesta sería, el dominio razonable sería números que no son negativos y que son integers, números enteros. All right, moving on. Caitlin has a movie rental card worth $175. After she rents the first movie, the card's value is $172.25. After she rents the second movie, its value is $169.50. Okay, so assuming the pattern continues... Write an expression to define A of N, the amount of money on the rental card, after N rentals. I'm going to display the answer because time is limited. Okay, look at that. She's The card starts with a value of 175. And for every movie that she rents, you're subtracting 275. 
How would you figure that out? You'd have to do 175 minus 172.25 and realize, hey, it gives you 2.75. You're subtracting 2.75 and then you're doing it again and again. You'd have to work that out, okay? But this is how you would write the function. Again, I'm trying to do a brief review, not a super detailed review, so you need to understand that. Let me continue. And by the way, here it's just working out how many... How many weeks can she rent uh, a movie before her movie money runs out? All right. Así que uh, Caitlin tiene una ca una tarjeta para alquilar películas que tiene un valor de 175 y cada vez que cuando cuando alquila la primera película, okay, <laughs> um, el valor que queda en la tarjeta es lo siguiente y después de la segunda lo siguiente se tienen se tienen que dar cuenta que está empezando con 175 y para cada película que alquila el costo es dos dólares y setenta centavos. All right, moving on. Complete the table of values be below. All right, the top part is super easy. You just inputting every value of x. Like when x is five, put it right here. Five times four is twenty. Twenty plus eight is twenty eight. And then do the same thing over here. When x is 5, 7 times 5 is 35. 35 minus 11 is 24, all right, etc. You would do that and fill out the whole table. That part is easy. And then it says use the table to determine an approximate solution of this, all right? Let's look at this a second. All right, um... Okay, so this this kind of a, uh, I don't really like this question, but let's look at it just in case you, you see something like it. So when would, the question is when would 4x plus 8, when would this equation equal this equation? All right, when? So if you look at their values, it's always different. The closest they get to being the same is right here. This is the closest they get to, to being the same answer. When x equals 6.5, you're, you're, that's the closest you get to getting the same answer in both equations. So it says use the table to determine an approximate solution. So the approximate solution is x equals 6.5. Again, I don't really like that question. It's kind of silly, but whatever. It says this solution is the best approximation. Okay. Así que la parte de arriba tenemos que llenar la tabla sustituyendo los diferentes valores para x en cada ecuación. Aquí abajo dice que tenemos que usar la tabla para determinar la solución aproximada donde... 4x más 8 es igual a 7x menos 11. Si miran esta tabla, los más nunca los números lo, las respuestas nunca son iguales. Lo más cerca que llegan a siendo igual es aquí en esta línea cuando x es, es, es uh, igual a 6.5. Así que eso es la solución aproximada donde las dos ecuaciones son igual o lo más cerca que llegan a, a siendo igual. All right. All right, look at this one because this one's easy and this is the type of thing that uh, a lot of you guys would look at and be like, oh man, I don't know how to do that. Let me just guess. All right, where if you just take a second to look at it, it's really not difficult at all. All right, so, um, all right, so here they give you two different functions. You got this function, f of x equals negative x plus 3, and this one over here, g of x equals negative x minus 2. Now it says if g of x can be written as f of x plus x, what is the value of, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. If g of x can be written as f of x plus k, what is the value of k? All right. So they're saying g of x is, g of x is negative x minus 2. So it's saying, hey, I could write this function. Hold on, let me do that better. I could write f of x is negative x plus 3, right? Do you agree? All I did is take what f of x is, which it says it right here, and I just wrote it right here. It says I could write it, I could write g of x as f of x plus a number, like a number that I'm going to put here. So what number would I have to put here so that what's written here will be g of x, will equal g of x? I'll say it again. What number do I add to f of x so that it'll become what g of x is, negative x minus 2? Well, let me see. They both have negative x in the front. But this one says plus 3. So what number can I add to change that plus 3 to a negative 2? All right. How about if I do a positive 3? Well, by the way, you could use the answers to guide you. All right. But how about if I do positive 3 minus 5? That'll work. Positive 3 minus 5 
will give you negative 2. And that's the answer. All right. So uh, I'm going to say it in Spanish. Hopefully you got that. If not, <laughs> try to listen to me in Spanish. Maybe it'll make more sense. Okay. Así que te, al principio te da dos funciones diferentes. Aquí tenemos f de x y aquí g de x. Pero dice que si g de x se puede escri escribir de la forma f de, x, f de x más k, ¿qué valor tiene que tener k? Ok, f de x, aquí dice que es negativo x más 3. Así que, ¿qué número le puedo sumar o restar a esa expresión para que sea lo que dice aquí? Negativo x menos 2. Los dos dicen negativo x al principio, así que lo que le tengo que poner es qué número le sumo o resto a positivo 3 para cambiarlo a negativo 2. Pueden usar la respuesta para guiarse, pero tiene que ser positivo 3 menos 5 para que esto sea negativo x menos 2, que es lo que es g de x. Así que esto sería la respuesta. All right, moving on. Look, this one... Um, I don't have time to go over what this means, and it's not right anyways. So uh, let's just look at the correct answers. Okay, it says choose all the statements that are true about the graph. The x-intercept is 9. The x-intercept is where the graph crosses the, the x-axis, which is right there. So the x-intercept is 9. f of x is increasing when x is less than 1. Okay, that let's look at because that's something that that you guys may not understand or remember. But listen, remember that f of x is just another way of writing y. So if it's confusing to read f of x, just imagine it says y. y is increasing when x is less than 1. So let's look at the graph. Here's When x is less than 1, it's, it's to this side. So when x is less than 1, look, this, this graph is going up when x is less than 1. All right, that's what it's saying, that when x is less than 1, uh, y is increasing or f of x is increasing and then it's going to level a lot like as you see it starts to level off and become more horizontal but before x is equal to 1 it's going up and f of x is negative when x is less than 9 f of x is negative oh yeah yeah so when x is less than 9 which means from here to the left f of x which is another word for another way to say y is less than 9. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, let me try that again. When x is less than 9, f of x is negative. All right? When in other words, when x is less than 9, the y values are negative. They're all below the x axis. Think about it, it's not that difficult. All right? So let me try that. Well, let me repeat some of this in Spanish, okay? Así que Um, no tengo tiempo de, de explicar cada parte de lo que cada respuesta que dice aquí, ok, pero primero que nada tenemos que, que escoger todo lo que son verdaderos del gráfico. El x intercept es donde la, el gráfico cruza el axis de x, que es aquí donde x es igual a 9. Recuerden que f de x es otra manera de escribir y. Así que si no si se confunden leer f de x pueden pensar que dice y. Y se está aumentando cuando X es menos que 1. Así que cuando X es menos que 1, um, así que de aquí para la izquierda, Y está aumentando. Y cuando pasa X igual a 1, empieza a ponerse más horizontal. Y aquí Y es negativo cuando X es menos que 9. Así que de aquí... En esta dirección, todos los valores de Y son negativos. Recuerden que Y es lo mismo que F de X. All right, moving on. Two identical water tanks each hold 10,000 liters. All right, so look, that's your starting point. And notice that all these equations start with 10,000. Tank A starts full, but water is leaking out at a rate of 10 liters per minute. Tank B starts empty and is filled at a rate of 13 liters per minute. Which functions correctly describe the combined volume of both tanks after T minutes? All right. <clears throat> okay, so let me write an equation for each one, right? Tank A. It starts at 10,000. 
uh, but water is leaking out at a rate of 10 liters per minute. They're using the variable T for time, so let me use T for time. So it starts at 10,000, and 10 liters per minute are leaking out. And tank B, it starts empty. I mean, I'm not going to write it, but you can write zero plus, but let's not write zero plus because that's pointless. It starts empty and is filled at a rate of 13 liters per minute. All right, so which function correctly describes the combined? So basically, I got to add these two. If I add these two um, expressions, it's going to be 10,000. Negative 10t ten plus 13t is 3t. So this is the correct answer. And by the way, there's a, uh, hold on, I'm making sure, oh, the top one is also correct. The top one is also correct. The top one is what I wrote up here, and after I simplified it, I got this answer right here, okay? Um, así que dice que hay dos tanques de agua identical. Cada uno aguanta esta cantidad de agua. El, 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 el tanque A empieza lleno con 10.000 litros, pero la agua está um, saliendo en un rato de 10 litros por cada minuto y están usando el variable T para tiempo. Así que empezamos con 10.000 y le está restando 10 litros cada minuto. Y el tanque B empieza um, vacío y está, se llena a 13 litros cada minuto. ¿Cuál función correctamente describe el volumen combinado? de los dos tanques después de 10 minutos. Así que si sumo las dos expresiones, me da esta respuesta, lo que dice aquí arriba. Y si simplifico esa expresión combinada, me da lo que dice aquí. Así que ahí están mis dos respuestas. All right. Emil collects data about the amount of oil A in gallons used to heat the house, his house per month for five months, and the average monthly temperature T in degrees of the function. All right, so, all right, this, this for, I'm trying to hurry up because this is taking forever. Um, there are the answers. Just look at the answers because, honestly, I'm trying to speed up this video, and if it's too long, you guys won't look at it, <laughs> or at least not all of it. So um, just look at the answers. Notice it has temperatures down here and the oil used up here. I'm not going to go over this one because it's just a matter of checking the answers and, and comparing them with what's in the graph and making sure you understand it. Guys, I think for the remaining examples, I'm just going to display the answer to finish this video because it's taking too long. I think I'm going to go over this one, though. Um, all right, because um, I remember looking at this one earlier. So it says, in a factory, the cost of producing N items is the following. Which function describes the average cost okay, uh, of producing one item when N items are produced? All right, so remember to get the average. Like, let's say you take, I mean, everybody should know this, but I'm always shocked at how many people don't know it. Let's say you take three tests. Let me put up some, and you get these grades on the test. 80 plus, I don't know, 50 plus 100, all right? The way to get their average is you add up all three numbers, and then you divide by the number of items there, which in this case is three, and whatever it gives you, that's your average, okay? Um, so notice that in this function, n represents the number of items, all right? So the cost of producing n items. So if I make one item, I input one, work it out, that's what it costs. Two items, you input two, work it out, that's what it costs, all right? So what would be that, after you do all that, what would be the average cost? You would have to divide everything by the number of items, which is n. I know, I know this one's one that you got to think about, and some of you may not follow me, but notice something. If I divide everything by the number of items, which is n, these n's cancel out, and I will be left with c of n equals 25 plus 150 over n, and that's the answer. I know some of you are not going to get that, and some of you will. Like I said, I don't have time to spend uh, 15 minutes um, talking about this one, all right? So we're just going to have to leave it at that, okay? Recuerden que para coger el averaje, siempre se divide por la cantidad por los, la, uh, la cantidad de, de cosas que uno está, uno está sumando en el proceso de cogiendo el averaje. Okay, en esta función, 
N representa la, la, el número de cantidad de, de cosas que están produciendo. Así que si al final divido por el, la cantidad de cosas que producí, que, que es representado por N, okay, si divido esa expresión por N, et, estas N se cancelan y lo que me queda es la respuesta que está aquí. Okay. Sorry, sé que no traducí eso muy bien, pero <laughs> estoy apurado. All right. Um, hey, this is another easy one. Let's look at it, okay? Which is something that maybe you didn't get a chance to do last year. But look, they give you two functions, f of x and g of x. And they want you to add them as well as subtract them. All right, and this is actually easy. So let's look at it, okay? Nos dan dos funciones, f de x y g de x. Tenemos que sumar las dos uh, funciones y también restar las dos funciones. Y esto es fácil. All right, so to add them, look what I'm going to write, all right? f of x is x squared plus x minus 6. I just wrote this right here. And I'm gonna, they want me to add it with g of x, which is what's what, what, right here. Now just combine like terms. Combinen los términos iguales. x squared plus x squared is 2x squared. Um, there's only one x to the first power. And negative 6 minus 4 is negative 10. By the way, I shouldn't have written that exponent. Let me just write it again. 2x squared plus x minus 10. So this is my answer when I add them. Now let me subtract them. Let me do this over here f of x minus g of x. So f of x is x squared plus x minus 6. All right, there is one thing I want to point out here. When you subtract them, I'm going to subtract it. I'm going to put parentheses, and I'll tell you why. g of x is x squared minus 4. When you subtract, you actually got to distribute the minus sign to each of this. So this one's easy to get right, even if you're not that, like, that uh, if you haven't practiced this much before. But this one is easy to mess up. Because most people would forget to distribute that negative sign, and that would mess up part of their answer. So when you distribute that negative sign, you would get minus x squared plus 4. All right? So now I do the same thing. I combine like terms. x squared minus x squared cancels out. I'd have this x, and negative 6 plus 4 is negative 2. So this would be my answer for the second part which is the one that, that you're mo most likely to mess up, okay? Esta parte es fácil, pero cuando restan, cuando se resta, tienen que distribuir el signo negativo a cada uno de los términos, que esto es la parte que muchos de ustedes no se van a dar cuenta, así que eso es donde te cogen, okay? Um, donde te engañan, okay? Así que cuando distribuyo el signo negativo, este 4 va a ser positivo, Y esto sería mi respuesta final cuando combino los términos iguales. All right, so there's my answer. Uh, here's another one where what would be the most appropriate domain? All right, I'm telling you, these are easy. You can't mess these up. Officials, officials in a town use a function C to analyze traffic patterns. C of N represents the rate of traffic through an intersection. Where n, that's the key part, n is the number of observed vehicles. All right, can the number of observed vehicles be like 3.4756? No, it's got to be a, a vehicle, they've got to be integers. And they can, you cannot observe a negative amount of vehicles. All right, so they got to be positive numbers, they got to be whole numbers. Could zero, could you observe zero vehicles? Yeah, if no car passes by, you observe zero vehicles. So the only possible answer has to be this one right here. Again, that's an easy one. That's just a matter of reading it and taking like one second to think about it. Okay, um, así que aquí quieren saber el dominio razonable, como ya hicimos en otro ejemplo. Dice que esta función representa el tráfico que están observando. N representa el número de carros que uno observa que pasa. Así que el número de carros no puede ser negativos, tampoco puede ser um, una fracción o un decimal. Tienen que ser números enteros. Así que la única respuesta razonable sería D. All right, now I'm just going to run through some examples that you guys could look at later and pause the video because this video is taking way too long. All right, remember to be a linear function. Quick, quick explanation on this one. When you distribute this 4 to everything inside the parentheses, 
All right, this is going to take a second. Let me do it real quick. All right, there's my problem. So when I distribute the 4 to everything in there, I'm going to get 12x squared plus 20x minus 16. When I distribute this negative 6, think about it as negative 6. To everything in there, you're going to get negative 12x squared minus 12x plus 6, okay? Now combine like terms. Notice that the x squareds, x squareds, yeah, I guess I said it right, more or less. Uh, they cancel out. 20x minus 12x is 8x. And negative 16 plus 6 is negative 10. Notice that when I worked all this out, look what I was left with. That's in slope-intercept form, basically. Remember that to be a function, a linear function, you could write it in slope-intercept form. All right? So um, that's how you would check which one of these are linear. You'd have to simplify everything that's there and see are you left with something like this. Notice that when I did this, the x squareds cancel out. All right? Um, Así que aquí tienen que simplificar para ver cuál de, la, de estas expresiones, cuando lo simplifica completamente, te da um, una función lineal. Recuerden que una función lineal se puede escribir en la forma slope-intercept, que es lo que tengo aquí. Cuando distribuí los números, eso eliminó eh, los términos que, que tenían x a la 2. All right? Remember, um, linear functions can be written in slope-intercept form. Alright guys, that concludes this part of the review for linear functions.